you know, the very title of the lecture, The Compatibility of Neuroscience and the Soul, you know, it would seem to tell you that we wouldn't expect these two things to be compatible, that, that somehow that the results of, of the modern neurosciences are incompatible with the traditional view of the soul. And I think that is the view of the proverbial person on the street, that, that there's some problem here. And what I want to do tonight is to say at least, you know, from the tradition of philosophy that I work from in the, in the broadly Aristotelian Thomistic tradition, uh, that appearance of incompatibility is based on a confusion. It's based on a very deep confusion of what it is we even mean by a soul. Okay. So I want to talk first about what we don't mean by soul. All right. And uh, I want to begin with a quotation from Herbert McCabe, who is a uh, deceased uh, Dominican, I think in the early 2000s. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, so quoting uh, Father McCabe, Christians are sometimes thought to believe that people have souls rather in the way that others believe in Father Christmas or fairies at the bottom of the garden. I mean souls are thought to be extra entities beside what are recognized by other, perhaps more skeptical, and tough-minded people. We all know about bodies, but Christians are thought to tell us that, besides the visible bodies that we can scientifically examine, there are other invisible things called souls, more or less loosely attached to those bodies. End quote. Okay. Uh, and, and, I mean, McCabe is maybe being less than fair to, to certain views there. But the idea is when we say soul today, we typically think of something like a ghost, right? Uh, and, you know, in the popular mind, we think of maybe it looks like me, but you can see through it, right? And, but we, what, what, the idea behind that is we think of the soul uh, in two ways. One, we think of it as the seed, seed of consciousness, that there are certain attributes that my body has, and those are all straightforwardly physical attributes, right? My height, my weight, you know, my position in space, and the velocity I'm traveling, my mass. And then on the other hand, there are these other attributes, uh, the contents of my thinking, the qualitative states of my sensations, and these attributes are had by the soul. And so the idea is first that there's two types of attributes, so you need two types of things to have the attributes, two types of substances to have them. Okay. And the soul has the conscious attributes, and the body has the non-conscious att attributes. Uh, secondly, you know, the soul in this, in this view, you know, what I, like, what I call tonight, maybe in a less than fair way, the garden fairy view, is that the soul is a substance. And what I mean by substance, well, it's a persistent individual thing that exists all on its own. It's not just a dependency. Okay. And, you know, basically we think of uh, substances are not the ways things exist. They are the things that exist in various ways. Uh, typically, when we think of a substance, we're thinking of something that we can either detect directly with our senses, or it's something that we can detect through its effects. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, we might think, yeah, the, the, the macro physical objects in this room are all substances. You know, I can see them. I can, I can maybe watch them persist through time. Controversial, I understand. <laughs> right? uh, I can see that, in, at least to common sense, they persist through time. And we might say that, you know, other things that we can't see, you know, uh, distant planets, subatomic particles, but we can detect their effects. And the best explanation of these effects is the existence of some substance as the cause of them. Okay. Uh, those are the substances, right? Either the things that we can directly witness or the things that we have to posit for, for the thing, for the effects that we can witness. Okay. And typically it's thought, well, the soul is one of these substances. It persists in its own right, maybe independently of the body, and we can witness its effects, right? Its effects are our conscious states. And because since bodies don't have conscious states, souls must have them, and so that's why we think there are souls, as we argue from this certain type of effect. Okay. So that's, that's I think, the common view of the soul. It's the, it's the you know, the... You've all heard of you know dualism or you know stemming from Rene Descartes. Um, I think most Christians, I think the cave is right. That's the way they do think about souls. All right, now most Christians not in the like the Catholic tradition, but I mean just in the pew. All right. So why would we think neuroscience is incompatible with all that? All right. Well, you know. And, and I, I, I don't want to uh, get over my head scientifically here, but I think we can say this, 
is that what neuroscience does, in part at least, is it's discovering what are in fact physical causes for our conscious states. Okay. Uh, is as the neuroscience has advanced, and I think I think that the degree to which they have advanced has been has been greatly exaggerated in the popular mind. But as they advance, we're getting increasingly precise correlations between mental states, right, and states in central nervous systems. And the most plausible explanation of that is that the cause of those mental states is in fact these states in the central nervous system. Okay. Um, and you know, but and whether it be you know studying pathology, you know we know when certain parts of the central nervous system is damaged, that certain types of mental states don't come around anymore, right? Or they're truncated. Uh, we know through various imaging techniques that certain parts of the brain are certainly active when mental states are going on, and it becomes increasingly plausible to say that, in fact, those mental states, these so-called physical attributes, are indeed caused by events in the central nervous system. And so suddenly now you wonder. Are there any effects that we need a soul to explain if we don't have just a perfectly plausible explanation based on the neurosciences? Okay. And on this view, if you think of the soul as a kind of substance, right? If you think of the soul as a substance that we posit the existence of to explain the occurrence of these, these non-physical attributes, so-called non-physical attributes, then it would seem that neurosciences and the notion of a soul are in some kind of competition, right? As the neurosciences discover more physical causes, then it would seem the room for a soul to operate or the room for us to argue that there is such a thing is constantly narrowing. And if you, and you would, uh, it's on a trajectory that you would expect that at some point there'll be nothing left to explain that can't be explained by the neurosciences, all right? So if you think then of the soul in that way, if you think of it as a substance separate from the body, and you think of it as something that we, th that we claim to exist based on the effects that we witness in our consciousness, then I would say neuroscience and the soul probably are incompatible, that there is a problem here. And that eventually, with the advance of neuroscience, our reasons for thinking that there is a soul, there is a soul, will dwindle, okay? Um, I like to call this sort of the soul of the gaps argument. You might have heard this sort of talk in, in philosophy of religion or arguments about God where, you know, we might have said that we need, we need, you know, a deity to explain the occurrence of lightning, right? So Zeus did it. And then, well, it turns out, yeah, we've got a pretty good physical explanation for lightning now. Okay, well, then that's not what God's doing, right? But we still haven't really explained, you know, why it rains. Well, no, no, we got a physical explanation for that. And what's happening is that as the gaps in our physical explanations start to close, then what happens to the room for something like a theistic explanation? There's less and less need for this, right? The gap is closing. And because we haven't given a principled reason to think God exists, we've just argued from ignorance. We don't know why this happens physically, so we posit a non-physical explanation. Okay. Um, and I think that's a worry in philosophy of religion. Uh, by the way, I don't think that's how arguments for God's existence actually do work, but I do think it's a worry. And I think that's a worry in philosophy of mind also. Okay. Now, I'm not saying there aren't problems, all right? Uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, neuroscience is anywhere close to a completed, completed science or anything like that, right? I'm not sure we know what that would mean. I'm not saying that issues like subjective states, you know, how is it that, uh, you know, when I used to take an example from Thomas Nagel, um, his example, not mine, when I eat chocolate, I have the experience of the taste of chocolate, but there's nothing physically in my brain that would taste like chocolate, right? So Nagel actually suggests that you lick someone's brain to find that out, right? Okay. Um, and so, you know, there, there, I think that's a legitimate question. Like, why is, how, how is it that the subjective aspect of consciousness is caused by the objective features of the nervous system? Okay, I agree. That's a difficult question. Uh, and there's all sorts of looming questions in philosophy of mind. However, right, uh, the fact that something is mysterious right, uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's a problem. At some point, you know, the spade turns, and we, we've gotten as far as we can go with the explanation. And, and I'm very sympathetic to various emergentist views that say, you know, in the same way, in the, you know, the way some philosophers like John Searle will argue, that liquidity is not a property 
of any of the individual water molecules, right? But, it's, but it is a property of systems of water molecules. Uh, and you, in, in giving an explanation of why that's the case, doesn't really seem to be anything we can do. It's just at that point, we've hit rock bottom, right? That we know when you get enough water molecules together, this is what happens, right? And, and it's, a, it's a feature of the system. Likewise, I think it's available to say, at some point, we're going to come and studying the relation of consciousness to brain, well, we'll hit rock bottom. And we'll say, some of these things like subjective states, we agree that there's nothing, no part of your brain has these attributes, but when you get a whole system together, it's an emergent feature. Okay, or at the very least, I don't think there's anything I can do to rule that out as such. Okay. So if that's what's leading us to think there's a soul, is simply that we need something to be the, the substance that carries consciousness over and above the brain, I don't think there's any need to think there's a soul then. Okay. Uh, and if, if that's the case, then I think a soul of the gaps kind of argument is going to fail us. All right. Luckily, I don't think that has anything to do with why people in the Thomistic tradition think there's something like a soul. Okay. All right. In the way of like taking all that back now, or not taking it back, but having something positive to say about soul, I want to make a couple of general points. I want to talk about the notion of a category mistake. I'm taking this notion and the, basically the example of it from a philosopher named Gilbert Ryle, with whom I don't agree about much, but uh, this is a great example. All right. So Chad picked me up from the hotel room today, and let's say, you know, after, let's say Chad gives me a tour around the campus, and he shows me the buildings, and he shows me students, and he shows me faculty members, and libraries, and, and laboratories, you've got lots of those, I bet, right? Okay, and uh, playing fields and all these things, and we get to the end, and I say, yes, but you didn't show me Brown University. Where's the university? Uh, you know, Chad's a graduate student in philosophy. He would say, you know, we need to get the check back and get Dr. Madden back on the plane because he's fallen into a categorical error here, right? Because what it is, is I, in that case, what I have done is I've confused the kind of thing we think a university is. I'm assuming university is just one building among the other buildings here, or it's a person among the persons here, when in fact, that's not the kind of thing a university is at all. It's actually a relation among all these things, okay? It's not something you can just take me to and show me Brown University. Uh, I mean, the Board of Regents could decide to move this thing to Kansas, right? Where I come from, they won't do that. Don't, don't panic, <laughs> right? It'd be good for me, all right? Uh, they, they could move the university. The university exists independently of all these things here, right? Uh, it's no one of the things here, but it's still a real thing. It has an integrity of its own. Right? There, there are uh, claims about the world that, can, that we can only think of as being true in as much as there is such a thing as Brown University. But to think of it as a building among the buildings or a faculty member or something like that is to, con is to fall into a confusion. It's to think of something that is a relation among things as if it's an individual that holds one of those relations. D does that make sense? Okay. Uh, and so if you ask me though, what effects does Brown University have over and above these buildings? and over and above these faculty members, and over and above these students? Where is the evidence for the existence of Brown University that you can show me right, that we need to posit the existence of the university? I don't think anyone can do that, because it's not that kind of thing. It's not a substance. Right? It's a relation among the parts of a substance. Right? Or not, uh, it's a relation among a bunch of substances. It's not a substance. It's still a perfectly real thing. Okay, Different kind of thing, though. All right, now, um, I want to divert for a moment and talk about an argument for God's existence. And I've not come here to defend this argument at any length, okay? Uh, you know, I want to be careful talking about uh, Thomistic arguments for God's existence with Dominicans here to let you know. Look, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just glossing here, Father. Okay, all right. Uh, but I think this will help you see the point of where I'm going to, okay? So I want to talk to you about, it it's really is Aquinas' first way from the famous five ways. And it's basically Aristotle's argument from motion, which is a Thomas adopts that from Aristotle, more or less, okay? Uh, Aristotle believed in a very gapless universe, all right? Uh, Aristotle thought that every effect in the universe 
has a determining cause in some sense based in the very natures of things. Okay. Uh, there are accidents, there's chance in the universe, but, but, but by that he doesn't mean there's anything that doesn't have some sort of explanation from within the universe. Okay. His universe is very gapless. All right. But Aristotle wonders, so you, about, you have this universe and all these things are changing. And even though he can give you an explanation of why each of them changes based on its direct cause of change, he still wonders why is there any change at all in the universe, okay? Uh, and now, no, Aristotle is not looking for a explanation of any particular change in the universe. He's got that, right? He thinks he can do good science, or he'd call it philosophy of nature, to find the cause of every specific event. But he wants to know, but why is anything changing right now at this moment? And for that, he says, I must have something that changes things, but itself doesn't change. Okay? Or, and he uses the language of motion, right? Uh, I need something that doesn't move, but moves other things. Why? Because I need an explanation of why there is any motion or change going on at this moment in the universe. Even though. I can give you an, an explanation of the change of all the things I'm at least directly acquainted with. Okay. Um, and so then Aristotle comes to the conclusion that I, what I need now is to say there's an unchanged change, as I like to put it, or an unmoved mover, more famously, how he puts it. Okay. Now, uh, leaving aside you know, whether the argument works or not, that's not what I've come here to talk about. Uh, I have my sympathy, so. Uh, if you went to Aristotle then and you said, but hey, which thing in the universe is the unmoved mover moving? Right? Show me the, the effect of the unmoved mover. Show me the gap in the physical system that the unmoved mover fills. Aristotle would look at you and say, with the same quizzical look that Chad would give me if I asked him, where is Brown University? Because it's a category mistake. Right? He's not claiming right, that the unmoved mover is just one changer among the things that change. He's not claiming that the unmoved mover explains any specific change directly in the universe. He thinks that it's the explanation of why there is a whole universe of moving things. Do, do, do you see the point there? Okay, now, I, and I'm not saying that uh, the unmoved mover and Brown University are the same kind of entity, you have the same kind of relationship. The point is, is these are two cases where category mistake would come up. If you ask a theist, you know, like Aristotle, why, you know, show me the effects that God has in the universe, the reaction to that should be, you don't understand. <laughs> You've fallen into a category mistake. God's not that kind of thing that we look for, save miracles, of specific effects like that, all right? Likewise, in the same way, it's, that's the same mistake as, as if you know, I ask Chad, where is the university after he shows me all of you and all the buildings? It's not that kind of thing, okay? So here's where, where all that's been going. My view is that the typical way of thinking about the soul falls into a category mistake. To think of the soul as a substance, to look for the specific effects of a soul, right, is a category mistake. The soul is not that kind of thing. Does that mean it's not a real thing? No, it's quite real. It's just not the kind of thing that we think of when we think of the garden fairy view here. Okay. So, what is it? Um... Let's take uh, the podium here. All right. I'm going to claim, make two claims about this podium. Uh, I want to say that it has what I'm going to call a synchronic identity, an identity all at once, that its parts don't have, okay, over and above its parts. And what I mean by that is we could take this desk and we could smash it with a sledgehammer such that all the parts were still here, but the desk would not persist, all right? So the point is, is whatever the desk is, or the, pardon, the podium, it's a, a desk in my notes, sorry. <laughs> whatever the podium is, uh, it's not just the collection of the parts. Because we can have the parts and not have the podium. Okay, now we, we can argue, and I would have sympathies to this about the sense in which there really are podiums over and above the parts, but just give me the example of, of the artifact, okay? Uh, and so in this sense of the fact that the parts could persist and the podium not, I want to say that there's a, an identity the podium possesses that is distinct from the identity of the parts. 
okay? Likewise, I want to say that the podium has what I'll call a diachronic identity, a di identity over time. And by that I mean, if we pulled out one screw, uh, except those of us who have been exposed to a lot of philosophy for good or ill, we would not ponder whether or not we had indeed lost, you, you, you were into, yeah. Okay, yeah, right, it's out there. I have my sympathy, so. All right, so we would not indeed be wondering whether we had lost the podium, okay? We'd say, no, we just lost a part of it. And if I put another screw in there, we wouldn't say, oh, lo, it's a brand new podium because there's a new screw in there, okay? Um, we would say, no, the podium has a sort of identity that it can carry over time through change in its parts, okay? Uh, you know, once again, I, I actually have my doubts about whether the podium has that specifically, but I just want to use an, an artifact to make the point, okay? All right, now, um, this is what leads Aristotelians, leads Aristotle, right? to make this famous distinction between matter and form, okay? And I think the word form in, you know, the, in, in, in among, philosophy among Catholics today is one of the most abused words out there, okay? Uh, and so all that an Aristotelian really means by a form is whatever it is provides, say, the podium with an identity that it's over and above its parts, all right? And it's all that whatever it is that provides the podium with an identity such that it can persist through a change in its parts. Okay? So the idea is that since I can smash up the podium with a hammer or a sledgehammer and still have all its bits there and not have the podium, the podium must be something that is the bits plus something else. Okay? In this case, all that is, all that form is, is a structural arrangement among the parts. Now, is that a substance? Heavens no, right? But is it a real thing? Of course it is. Why? Because if there weren't such a thing, there wouldn't be podiums. Okay? Likewise, I, you know, I would say, in as much as podiums do persist through changes in their parts, the podium isn't identical to its parts. It's going to be identical to whatever parts it possesses at the moment. And this thing, a form. What is the form? It's whatever lets it persist through changes in its parts, what's maintained. Uh, in this case, right, it's just going to be the structural arrangement. Mm -hmm. All right. Does that make sense? Okay. So broadly speaking, you know, when Aristotelians talk about matter, what they mean is the stuff something is made out of. It's what has the potential to be that kind of thing among other potentials it has. What is the form? It's whatever is added to that matter, right, I have to be careful with words like added, whatever, whatever is added to that matter such that the matter realizes one of its potentials as opposed to others, right? So if we smashed up this, po this podium back to the wood and the plastic and what have you, that wood and plastic could become all sorts of artifacts. It doesn't have to be a podium. So once again, we need a kind of explanation here. Why is this a podium when its parts could have been something different? Well, whatever that explanation is, that's the form, okay? Now, I have what, you know, one which should call a very functional view of what matter and form are, all right? And I, that is controversial among Thomas, all right? I mean, I'm sort of controversy alert here. But my view is the way we should define matter, we should define form is in terms of the work they do. What is, what is the matter? It's whatever has the potency to be a certain way among others, all right? What is the form? Whatever is done to that thing such that it realizes that potency rather than others it could have had, okay? Um, and so I, I am very much a functionalist about matter and form, but those of you playing at home, I'm not a functionalist in the philosophy of mind, if you be careful with that, okay? All right, does this make sense? Now, I would say in the case of the podium, what we have here is what's traditionally called an accidental form. I don't think we really get a new substance when we put together the parts into the podium, all right? I think what you really have is just an accident of the wood and the plastic. There's no natural set of changes that this thing will undergo in virtue of it being a podium that are in any way distinct from the natural set of changes it would undergo if, uh, in virtue of being wood and plastic or what have you, okay? So I would say what you get here is an accidental being, not a substantial being, okay? 
uh, I don't think anything really new comes into existence with it. You just get a new accident in something that was already there. Okay. Now, um, with matter and form in mind, I'm going to move here. And I guess I should maybe give a trigger warning to cat lovers because I'm going to use an example rude to cats. Okay, so uh, and freshmen at Benedictine College are every year scandalized by this example. So welcome aboard. So, <laughs> the rats wouldn't do that before. Okay, so um, rather than podium, let's say we have a cat. And our cat is playing in the yard, and she has an unfortunate run-in with the wood chipper. Okay? And so you now have on the far side of the wood chipper, say, three or four pounds of... It's not a cat anymore. It's the stuff that is sufficient to what? Compose a cat, right? But could that stuff be other kinds of substances? In principle, you know, you could make a couple squirrels out of that, right? You, you could, in principle, right? I mean, we couldn't technologically do it, but ultimately it's the same organic materials that make up a squirrel. Or, you know, you could make a little pony out of it. Or really, if you want to get farther down, it could be wood. It could be a tree, right? If you want to get down to the particles and things, okay? So what you have on the far side of the, I'm sorry, on the far side of the wood chipper is you have not cat, but potential cat. You have cat matter, okay? But it's also squirrel matter. It's also tiny pony matter, whatever, all right? It could be a lot of things. So that would seem to tell you what you had on the near side of the wood chipper was not just matter. It was matter and form. Something has to be done to that matter. There has to be the presence of something in virtue of which you have a cat rather than the stuff on the far side of the wood chipper. Okay? And in that case, the, the Aristotelian is going to say, whatever, what, whatever you get with the addition of cat form to matter is, is a substantial form. It, it is a substantial being because there are all sorts of powers and capacities right? um, and, and, and a kind of integrity that the cat has that its matter does not have, right? Uh, the cat does more than what it ma its matter does. Like, so the wood, like this podium is just very slowly rotting wood. It's not developing in any way on any course of life over and above the wood that composes it. Whereas the cat is developing. It has powers. It, it's conscious. It's going to make more cats. It's going to maintain itself, right? Moreover, Many of its parts, if you want to talk at the level of organs or organelles, only exist in as much as they are parts of cats. Their identity is wrapped up with the identity of the cat in a way that we can take the screw out of this thing, and the screw is fine whether or not it's a part of the podium. Whereas if you take out the cat liver, immediately the liver can do nothing under its own power, and it's just now degrading former cat matter. Do you see the point there? Okay, so... In Aristotle's view, in Aquinas' view, there's something special about the forms of living things, okay? Because the resulting thing has this sort of substantial integrity that things like artifacts don't. So he says what they have is a substantial form, and he gives it a special name. He calls it a soul, okay? And, and by soul, then, in the Aristotelian tradition, all that's meant is that which has to be present in a living thing such that its matter is actually a living thing of that kind rather than the, the matter of a living thing of another kind that it could have been. D does that make sense? Okay. So I think the way to think of it is, is a form for, a substantial form for an Aristotelian is a kind maker. It's that about a thing that makes the kind of thing it is. And a soul just is the kind maker in a living thing. Okay, and I, I don't think a cat's soul is anything very metaphysically sexy, right? I think it is probably ultimately some kind of physical arrangement among the parts of a cat. Okay. And and likewise, you know, I think do I think the trees have souls? Yes, I do think trees have souls, right? It's not because I'm, I have a tendency to worship trees or something. It's because I think trees have a sort of substantial integrity that the podium doesn't have. 
all right, that they have this kind of identity that requires a special name, right? But all I'm saying here is a tree has a substantial form, meaning there's something that separates a tree from sawdust. Does, does that make sense? All right. Now note, though, um, the reason for thinking that things have souls in this tradition has nothing to do with consciousness, right? I, we, we didn't begin this discussion about souls in the Aristotelian tradition by talking about consciousness or talking about anything with psychological states. In fact, there are all sorts of unconscious things that people in my tradition think have souls, namely any living thing, right? Plants have souls in this sense. There's something that makes them have the integrity they have over and above just their parts that could, be, could exist without them, okay? Uh, and so that's why right up front, I think, when we talk about soul in the, tra the tradition that I'm coming from, and we talk about soul in the sense that there might be a conflict with, with neuroscience, there is no conflict here, right? We're not talking about the same kind of thing, all right? And likewise, if you, if you went to me and you said, well, show me the work the soul does. Show me the effects the soul accounts for, right? Show me the gap in the organism's physical systems that we need to posit a soul to explain, I would accuse you of a category mistake. You're asking me where the university is, okay? Because the soul is not something I'm positing to explain any specific effect going on in the organism. I'm positing the existence of the soul to explain the overall unity of the organism. The fact that the organism stands as an independent, distinct substance. That's not something that we go around detecting by its empirical effects. Does that make sense? And I would say what you're doing is you're looking for the soul to be a substance when, in fact, it is not. All right. Okay. Um, so, in the way I would say, well, uh, so keep in mind, too, when we say soul here, we mean something relatively boring. Okay. So, when, you know, we take the tree or let's say we, we smash up the... Uh, podium with a sledgehammer. The matter's still around, but what's come of the podium form? The podium form is gone, right? It's not a substance. It doesn't survive, right, the destruction of the substance, right? It doesn't survive the loss of integrity, because in this case, the form of the podium just is the integrity of the parts. It's not the kind of thing that survives, right? Uh, when, you, when you take the tree and you run it through the wood chipper, right? The soul of the tree is what? It's gone, right? Because all it is is a principle among right, the parts of the tree. All right? It's a rather boring thing. Okay? And likewise, I would say with Kitty, if she has this unfortunate accident or he has this unfortunate accident with the wood chipper, Kitty's soul is, it's gone, right? Because I think of Kitty's soul as something like a structural arrangement among the parts of the cat so that you get all these emergent properties of catness that come from that, okay? Does that make sense? All right, and this is very much Aristotle's view. He doesn't think that souls uh, are at all likely to survive the destruction of their parts, okay? All right, so that brings me to the hard part of the talk and the talk where I'm gonna, you know, in the last 10 minutes, pull out an argument that's very complicated and uh, do all sorts of hand-waving and act irresponsibly, right? But here we go. Because, uh, you know, we are speaking the Catholic tradition here, and, you know, the Catholic tradition will tell us not only do we have immortal souls, but it's demonstrable that we have immortal souls, okay? So this is, this is sort of a pickle. Yeah, <laughs> right. Now, so I want to I begin with a quote from Aristotle. Um, when it comes to the immortality of the soul, or I should say the separability, I want to even leave aside immortality. I just want to talk about separability. So something could be able to exist without a body, but not be immortal, all right? Uh, I just want to make the, a case about separability, right, and leave aside whether or not the soul could ever be destroyed to one side, okay? I'm going to do as little as I have to on this one. All right. Um, so Aristotle says something conditional about the separability of the soul. He says, quote, some parts of the soul may be separable because they are not actualities of any body at all. Unless the organism has some function that cannot be directly, ex this is me now, unless the organism has some function that cannot directly be exercised by a material thing, then the soul is destroyed when the living body dies. 
So when it comes to, if you're very carefully, when it comes to the separability of a soul, Aristotle puts this kind of in less in there. He says, yeah, always for the most part, he likes that, always for the most part, souls are destroyed when the substance that the soul of is destroyed. Unless there's some function of the organism that cannot be the function of something material. If there's a capacity or a power, uh, this is the way I interpret this, if there's a capacity or there's a power that an organism has that could not be an emergent feature of the parts of that, that organism, then there's some reason to believe that that soul is separable. Okay, meaning it could exist without the body. All right. And when you read Aristotle's book, De Anima on the Soul, you know, Aristotle likes a nice, t- nice tight package and a lot of gaps and things, and he's going through the types of souls, and everything's nice and neat, matter and form are codependent, you destroy the, you destroy the organism, right, you destroy the soul, then he gets to the human being, and it's sort of, oh, just got more complicated, he's uncomfortable, right? Uh, because he does recognize, and later, you know, St. Thomas will, and later Thomas will, that there is a capacity that human beings have that is very difficult to even fathom as being a capacity that straightforwardly emerges from some kind of structural arrangement of their parts. Okay. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain that capacity uh, in a way that I'm not, I don't, I'm not aware of directly Aristotle doing it this way. I'm not aware directly of Aquinas doing it this way, although he does say some things very close to it. But a lot of contemporary Thomists like to argue this way. Okay. Uh, I think the version I'm taking is most directly coming from a recently late uh, Catholic philosopher by the name of James Ross. Uh, and also, I could give you references to a paper of mine where I go into like, grave detail on this argument. But let me uh, talk for a moment just about the notion of deductive reasoning. Okay. So if I reason like this, you know, all, all humans are mortal. Socrates is a human being. Therefore, Socrates is, is immortal. Excuse me, Socrates is mortal. Okay. All S are P. X is P. Therefore, X, uh, X no, all S are P. X is S. Uh, therefore, X is P. Deductively valid, right? Meaning if those premises are true, there's no way the conclusion could be false. All right. Uh, it's absolutely certain, right? That that, or if we just take modus ponens, if p then q, p therefore q, there's no way those premises could be true, and that conclusion could come out false. All right. This is, uh, you know, you know something like like. I don't want I don't want to get an inductive reasoning, but to say that we do in fact reason deductively. I'm going to make that assumption, right? We could talk about that. Um, if you think about what deductive reasoning is, is when we do that, we're making claims that are universal, right? That a deductive, reason, deductive reasoning is valid in whatever format I put it into. You can put it into any language you want. You can put it into any uh, logical notation you want, right? Either in, in the argument is still valid, meaning if those premises are true, the conclusion absolutely must be true. Okay, uh, and so if you think of it, deductive reasoning has consequences, right? That are both universal and necessary. That they have, that they hold across all times, all places, right? That they extend not just to actualities, right? But they extend to past actualities, future actualities, and even mere possibilities. Okay. Uh, I think this is the best way to explain what we mean when we say that human thought has universal content, right? Is that, and I think the best way to see it is, is in the notion of deductive reason. In modus ponens, right, or uh, a basic syllogism is valid in all contexts. Not just all actual contexts, all possible contexts, okay? So the way I think of it then is that we have content in our thoughts that has infinite consequences, right? Uh, it doesn't have just finite consequences. It has consequences that transcend time, transcend space, right? Uh, transcend what is actual and stretch to what is possible, okay? Uh, the claim I will make is physical causes only have singular, particular, finite, spatial, and temporal consequences, all right? 
And so if there's content in our thoughts that is non-spatial, atemporal, infinite in its consequences, then there is something that in our thought that is always left unexplained, right? And not just we don't know the explanation yet, it's in principle inexplicable by any physical cause. Because physical causes only have finite, particular, spatial and temporal effects. Do you see that? Okay. Uh, if, if you want to talk about it in terms of universal concepts or something like that, that's fine. I mean, I think deductive reasoning, if we, if we do that, then we have to talk about nominalism and that sort of thing. Uh, and I think that's more controversial. I think it's harder to, to take seriously that we don't reason deductively. And I think if we do reason deductively, then at least some of our thoughts are structured by universal content, right? That they have infinite consequences, that transcend time, transcend space. And I don't think there can be a physical effect that transcends time, transcends space, and has infinite effects. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Now, that is not at all to say that I think when we reason deductively, it's happening freely of our nervous systems. Okay. I have no doubt that you can put, you know, a, anyone on an MRI, and at some point in the development of neuroscience, we might be able to tell whether they're reasoning by modus ponens or not. Okay? I do think that our nervous systems eventually will become good predictors, maybe, of what is going on in our deductive reasoning or our conceptual thinking. Okay? Uh, but I will say that is always going to be a, a correlation and not a cause because physical causes only have particular finite effects and deductive reasoning stre stretches to infinity. Right? It, it's universal, it's not particular, okay? Um, I think a good way to think about it is, and it's just an analogy, if, this is, this is, if you take the word, this is another example from McCabe, if you take the word dangerousness, all right, uh, we can say, we can express that concept in indefinitely many languages, okay? So there's nothing about the linguistic physical structure of the marks on a page or the sounds that determines it to mean dangerousness, okay? All right, but, so I, so I would say there's something about the concept of dangerousness that is not explained by any physical structure, but that's not to say we could ever express the thought dangerousness without doing it in some sort of language or some sort of neurological state, right? But there just is no full explanation of the concept by any physical structure. All right? So in as much as we can grasp concepts, then there too I would say there's something in the content of our thought that is not a physical effect. Even though I do think that our ability to exercise anything like that power is always wrapped up with something physical going on in our body. Okay. So, if that argument works, and we'll talk, uh, what does that really show us? Well, I mean, it, it doesn't show that I'll survive my death, per se. It would only show, at most, that my soul would, okay? Th th does that make sense? And, and Aristotle, you know, worries about this, because Aristotle has... You know, when he, when he gives a different sort of argument for the immort or separability of the soul, he says, okay, yeah, that, that's fine. The soul might, might survive, but he didn't think that sounded like terribly good news because it would just be his rational faculty, right? And, and he's worried about how you would individuate rational faculties when there's no matter, right, to individuate them. So Aristotle didn't see this as, like, terribly great news, Right? And in fact, I don't think anybody would until you have a Christian notion of the resurrection of the body. Right? Because the, the sense in which I'm even going to exercise my rational faculty, which I know is intimately connected with what goes on in my nervous system, the sense I'll even exercise that without my body, right, is far from clear. Right? And there's, there's, a, there's a, one of the great debates among Thomism is between a position called survivalism, right, in contemporary Thomism, a, between a position called survivalism which claims that with your soul you'll survive, and a debate between, uh, and the other side of it is corruptionism, which is the claim that, no, without your soul, you'll just, if your soul survives, 
Without your body, it won't be you. They'll claim that personal identity ends at that point and it'll pick up at a resurrection, okay? Uh, my own view is, I, at this point, I think we don't really know what we're talking about anymore because uh, I don't think we have a good way of talking about souls uh, independently of the bodies that we refer to them through, okay? Uh, we can talk about that if you like. But my point here is, is you have to understand the, 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 the Thomistic position, right, is scarily close to a materialist, all right? Uh, and I'm gonna be careful with that, but it, it is claiming, in some sense, you're a living body, okay? Uh, and what survives your death, when we talk about separability of a soul, okay, would be this thing that provides, you know, your, your integrity, right? But it's not, at that point, a bodily integrity, Okay, so whether or not it's even you that would survive is at least an open question, right? You are a bodily being, right? Even if you have a capacity that nothing bodily can fully explain. Does, does that make sense? All right. So I think, I think it's important to emphasize this because otherwise we start to slip back and we do this, Catholics do all the time, we start to slip back into the garden fairy view now, right? where my soul is this ghost that's kind of driving the car now, right? And it's separate from my body. It's not the view at all, right? Uh, that there is even a sense of a dependency of the soul and the body for it to exercise its function. It needs a nervous system to work with. Okay, D does that make sense? So, and so if you think of it, if the soul is um, simply the, the substance maker of a living body, then you, know, you come to be, right? You're at the point when you came to be a living body and you'll go out of existence, in my view, when a living body goes out of existence, all right? Does that make sense? And you know, this has, I think, a lot of the consequences for our ethical views in Catholicism. That's why we think we protect you your whole bodily life, right? Okay, okay that is all I have. So, thank you. So you're equating a soul to like basically making something alive, um, or yeah. Based on what I've got from your argument, can, can I do a time movies? out there first? Go for it. I want to be careful with that because I <laughs> that makes it sound like the soul is this extra life force in there. <laughs> you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, and I, I don't think that's at all how we should think about it. Right, because that would seem to make the soul a lot like the garden fairy that gets in there, and, and, and like you could have this perfectly formed cat body, and it'd be just structurally complete, and it's just there, and you just have to take a soul, like a thing, and put it in there, and voila, okay. Um, and so when you say that it's in virtue of the soul that the thing is alive, I don't mean the soul is some kind of efficient cause that exists outside of the, the body and pushes yeah. on and makes it alive. Okay, what I mean though is, in as much as the thing is. A, a substance with the integrity of an organism, then it has a soul. Do you see the, the distinction I'm making? It? So my yeah. question following that is, um, life forms created by man, like, yeah. so like clones and things like that, yeah. do you, like, based on your logic, do you think that those would then have a soul? And like, what, I guess, yeah. assigns a soul to a living organism? Like, do you believe yeah. that like, when something is created, that God assigns it that? And then what if its life is like man-made? Yeah, so let's say, let, I mean, let's say we, you know, we clone a sheep, right? We've done this, right? Yeah, yeah it, it, I think it has a soul. It's a living, it's a living organism, right? Uh, let's say you, you clone, God forbid you clone me, right? Essentially, you just, you've made an identical twin of me, right? Uh, and yeah, so that thing would have a soul, right? It's, it's a living organism with, with the kind of integrity that we associate with living organisms. So whatever causes a living organism, right? Uh, that's, that's not my concern, right? But once you have one, I would say, yeah, it has a soul, right? And, you know, when do we have a living organism and when don't we? That, that's a question I'm gonna punt to biologists, right? I, I, and I, I think, I, as a philosopher, I'm not, gonna be, I'm not gonna claim that I can decide that issue in the same way, uh, whether or not, you know, like, like, whether or not something 
there's a substantial difference between you know a tiger and a leopard. I don't claim to know that. I would punt that question to a biologist. And the, by the same token, you know what marks the difference between a living thing and a non-living thing? You know that I think is a a question I would let biologists fight out about, right? Sir, your name? Louis. Louis. Yeah. So I I wonder what you think about this sort of intuitive argument for claim that we don't have souls, <laughs> sure. given the setup. Um, so it seems possible, this is going to be two quick examples. Sure. First, it seems possible that uh, we get like woken up suddenly, and we realize that we've actually been robots the whole time, and we've been entering this really fun simulation of having a human life and so on. Intuitively, it seems like uh, we would still think that we were us, like we'd be super shocked probably, we'd be like, yeah. oh wait, I have these memories now that I'm doing that, I went into this on purpose and so on, sort of yeah. an experience machine thing. Okay. Secondly, it seems like uh, we might think we survive total replacement from organic to inorganic. So if we go yeah. get a bunch of yeah. stuff, and get all of our brain gets, starts to, gets made into like silicon parts or whatever, yeah. we just become, you know, if it's slow enough, our intuition might be, well, of course it's still me if you just do replace one screw, and then you yeah. do that with all the screws slowly, still have this psychological continuity. In both of those cases, it seems like we wouldn't have souls because we wouldn't be living on any any biological understanding. Yeah. So, uh, two two points. One, I don't think you're probably really not going to like this. Okay. So, <laughs> I, I don't I don't I don't take psychological continuity at all as having anything to do with why I think there are souls. Okay. So let me go with the second example first. Um, you start replacing parts of me with non-biological, you, know, you know, I become a cyborg, yeah. in the non-metaphorical sense. Yeah. Uh, I would say at some point, you just lost me. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to claim to know when that point is, but at some point, I was killed in that process. Even if the resulting being, although for Chinese room reasons, I don't think there would, this would work, even if the resulting being still has psychological continuity, I would say it's not Jim Madden, it's a Jim Madden simulation now. You, you lost Jim. Can I just follow up for the quick yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question really is sort of implicitly just uh, given that we have such a strong intuition against the one that you just stated, namely that like we'd still be there, then yeah. we might say soul's not relevant to who we are. Yeah, I, I just don't, I don't, this is why I don't like intuition stuff. I just don't have that intuition. Sure. I, I, I think that we, my intuitions run much more violently, right? Mm -hmm. that, it, it's, that wouldn't be me because it, it doesn't breathe. But um, that's not, that is not a knockout punch for your argument, but it's just, you know, this happens. Okay. The first example again was where you, all it's, this, this whole human life, yeah. life has been a simulation and we're actually robots or we're like software on a computer or something like that. Yeah. Oh, look, we decided to do this and now we're woken up. Yeah, so I would say in that, in that case, it turns out in that possible world, there are not things with souls. There are, I wouldn't say there are substances, and we've been wrong about that. See that. But that doesn't change the claim of what would be the case if there were substances or if there were souls. Right. You see that? If I could just put a little yeah, so, on it. But I'm not going to be able to prove there are such things. Totally. Yeah, but, yeah the, the point is to drive it home is if that's the case, then souls seem to have very little intuitive connection with our sense of ourself. If we have the intuitions that I have. Yeah, if, 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 if no, I, I agree with you. No, I agree. You know, if, if you, if, if what you mean by self is something like the Lockean notion of, of myself as subject of first person experiences like that, I think they, souls, that's my point, they have nothing to do with that, right? Now, and, and I do think that that aspect of our lives is overplayed in how we think of personal identity, definitely. So, I'm, yeah, I'm happy. I, I actually think the example makes me the point I want to make is. I, I think one first point is that the, the reason I think there are souls is nothing to do with personal identity in that Lockean sense. And two, I would make the point we way overemphasize personal identity in that Lockean sense. So, very good question. Thank you. Good evening, man. Uh, Joel. Well, you're saying the way you're describing soul doesn't sound much different than what we scientifically term as consciousness. Because you're saying that the soul ends when the body ends as well. And then you describe soul as like the contents of thinking and the quality of states that give us our conscious attributes. So where, is there yeah, that's, that's the very notion of soul I would ask you to reject. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, because 
in the tradition that I'm arguing from, we recognize all sorts of non-conscious things as having souls. Right? So for us, the, the, what the evidence or the arguments that are leading us to say there are souls has nothing to do with consciousness. It has to do with the integrity of things as organisms or substances. Right? So do you have a soul as an identity? Or a in a sense, yeah. Or I would say an identity maker, provider. So that's what you mean, like the form. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Louis will not like this one. Okay, but I, I, I actually think that you know you you could render me such that I will not have consciousness. But if I'm alive yet, you're still gonna have. Me. Okay, now, whether you can turn on the ventilator and stuff like that, the question, right? But I still think I'm around, right? If I'm still operating as a coherent organism. Your answer. Conrad, Conrad. Is something that disrupts the integrity of the nervous system that we talked about? Like, yeah. Say, for example, diseases of degeneration, like Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. Uh, what is your view on that? Because, uh, in that sense. Oh, but I'll get it. Right? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> play a lot of football, identity. so I'm a little worried about that one. So, your identity over time, especially for people with Alzheimer's disease, depending on <laughs> the type and the severity, yeah. uh, it tends to fade away. And it, Referring back to the podium example, yeah. you'd be like drilling holes in the podium. Right. So at some point, if you drill enough holes and there's enough degeneration, you're left with something that's not intuitively a podium. So in your view, yeah. do you think that loss of the soul occurs at some point along the progression of things that might affect the integrity of the brain, CMS? Uh, Is it right at the moment yeah. of biological death? Usually uh, I, for Alzheimer's patients, yeah. Typically, if they progress far enough, they'll be in a vegetative state. It's hard to say that there's any kind of identity left. But yeah. if what you mean by identity is is something like what, not just in fact, who's suggesting to us, right, that identity in terms of my first person ability to say who I am, right, or or if we think of identity as a continuity of psychological states, I think people lose that in Alzheimer's. Okay, that is not the kind of identity that I'm concerned with, right? As long as you have uh, the same biological integrity, right? It's the same organism. Even if it's no longer sustaining, you know, consciousness as well as it had, right? And just to use a funny example, it's become a really rickety podium, but it's still working as a podium, right? And someday I might become, and I don't mean to flip with this, rickety, right? But I'll still be a human organism. As long as you have a human organism, I say you still have two. And this is one reason why I think we should get away from thinking of personal identity in this first person psychological way and think of it instead in terms of biological. And I think this is why when, when we debate a lot of moral issues that the church takes a stand on, we, do, we, we argue past each other. Because on one side you have a view of personal identity that's entirely psychological, whereas the church's view of personal identity is a lot more biological. Your name, ma'am, Becker? Also, Olivia. Uh, uh -huh. We're rich with the <laughs> Yeah, I'm a, I'm a senior. Just going to your point about the two kind of tunistic views, um, one where like your soul survives, yeah. that means you survive, and the other where it's when the body and the soul are together that you exist. So like, I, I don't know if you know within that tradition, like what happens at the, in the Catholic understanding of the moment you die versus the final resurrection, when like yeah. everyone's body and soul reunite. So like, yeah. In those cases, is it the idea that like you cease to exist during that point? You go into some weird like yeah. frozen limbo. Yeah. Um, kind of what happens? You know, that this is a great idea. This is the third time I've given this lecture for for Kaminsky Institute, and every time in the question is previous, what we want to talk about. So I think I need to just do a lecture on this issue for Kaminsky Institute. Yeah. So it's your fault. Okay. <laughs> if I come back, it's your fault. No. So. The, your question is like, what's the Catholic view on that? And I think one reason why this is an interesting debate is what the Catholic view on that, or at least what the Thomistic view is on that, mm -hmm. is I think up for grabs. And there are people who, who can marshal some texts that would make Thomas look obviously a corruptionist. And there are people who can marshal some texts that make him look very, very survivalist. So what, what the right view is, I think is up in the air. Okay, I will admit, I have my... I'm a corruptionist leaning guy, okay? Uh, and, but everyone in the debate agrees the soul will separate, it'll, it'll survive death, 
Okay, now the question is, does my identity end with the destruction of the body, uh, or in some sense, does it continue with the soul, right? And everyone agrees you have it at the resurrection, okay? The, the corruptionist will say something like this, at, at pre-mortem, your, your uh, integrity constituted by two fundamental parts, a soul and matter, right? And then at your death, your a unity composed of just one of those parts, your soul. Now, I, I worry about how you could have been composed by two things integrally and then composed by just one of them. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, and the survivor, the corruptions say, no, your body's destroyed, you're destroyed, part of you hangs around the way we could preserve your thumb, right, and not have you, and then the resurrection, they come back. But then in that case, at the resurrection, like, would you, would you, for that pre-mortem state, like, come back, or is this, like, a new, like, the idea of, like, the yeah. okay. you, like, my, is that what they're Yeah, on? my understanding, uh, my understanding on this theologically, Right, as a Catholic, you've got to say, you're back, and you have the same body in some sense. Okay, You have to have identity of you and as the body over the gap in the inner state. Okay? Uh, and so you know, there's other thorny problems. How do you get the same body back if it's it destroyed and all that? Okay? So that, ha that is a matter of orthodoxy. has to be said. But it's, it is you. Now you may be glorified. I'll be much taller. Okay, right. All right. You may be glorified, uh, but it will will be you. Right. Your name? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. So, sir, so you're saying that the identity is not from the soul, but then in that case, the soul is not going to survive. It's not the identity has to be like wrapped yeah. up in what survives, and then underneath. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. It's got to be careful because you know some of my best friends are survivalists, and I, I want to be fair to their views. But th I find this very curious that somehow I'm I need I, like essential to me are my form and my matter at this point, and then I die, and now my matter isn't essential to me, and I can be me without the matter, and then I'm going to get back as an essential part at the resurrection. You see, that seems to me like there's a switch of of what I am essentially in the interim state, okay? So, but once again, it, it's a, it, it, these are not frivolous people, right? There, there's a lot of sophisticated reasons behind this. But you're, you're actually articulating why I actually reject it. Yeah, the right? Yeah, um, I recently, like, uh, last year, took a class all on, like, the different senses, like, um, senses of self, so. Sure. Like, you, what you're talking about, first-person perspective, but then also other, types of self, like a narrative sense of self or a bodily self, yeah. you seem to have a lot of importance linked to the like bodily sense of self and that like your identity basically erases once that's gone. But there are also like, there's also like, for instance, like social self where like someone, like Liz may view me as like, have an idea of like my sense of self from her own eyes. So I'm thinking back to like the cat example. Yeah. Um, when you describe that, I still would view that as a cat, just like, dead cat based sure. on like what I know it from before and I sure. guess I'm wondering like where like other perspectives play into your idea sure. of I guess I mean say Rover the neighbor thing. dog comes over and eats the pile sorry say Rover the dog comes over and eats the pile okay that's not a cat anymore right it's a cat instead of dog yeah, I mean, I mean, or it's it's going to become Rover Muscle, right? I mean, <laughs> but what I'm saying is like di there are like yeah. different people take different perspectives on like what identity something holds, like at different sure. time points. Sure. Um, I'm trying to. I mean, I agree. People will disagree about this, yeah. right? But I, I find it hard to believe that you could really, in a strict sense, say the pile on the far side of the woodchipper is a cat. If you say it's former cat, I'm with you, right? Mm -hmm. If you say in some sense in my life story, I'm gonna bury that because it's kitty, I, I would agree with you, but you've changed what we mean by identity there. You don't mean literally it's numerically the same thing, right? You mean in this other sense of identity, right? In my, in my, in my narrative about myself, and I don't mean to minimize that, it's an important mm -hmm. thing, right? In my narrative about myself, that's, I, I, that, that pile, <laughs> plays this important role, and I'm going to bury it, and I'm going to show reverence to it, and such as that. 
But no, we're not saying identity in the sense of it's numerically one and the same object. Mm -hmm. right. I guess what I'm picking up for clarification is um, if I hold the perspective, like if you say that a soul is what kind of classifies something as still like, or as like that last bit of form yeah. that you say like, oh, that is a cat. Yeah. If I still have it like, that cat could have died and been like torn to shreds, but I like have that past perspective of like that being a cat. So in my mind, even though it's all those parts, I know that it used to be a cat. And so I still think sure. that it is a cat. What, like that kind of, like the soul yeah. in that essence is gone, but there's still that remaining thought that that is sure. like, a cat in that sense, I guess. Yeah. But I, I would say if you literally said that's a cat, you're just in error. Okay. Okay. All right. And I don't think someone who says that's kitty really means that literally. Okay. Right. They mean that's the remains of kitty. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a sign of kitty. I mean, so, you know, for instance, I, um, you know, when, when, when my parents die, I will reverently bury them. Them. But what do I really mean by that? I don't, I think they're gone. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm burying the remains, which are a sign of who they were, but it's not mm -hmm. them. You see that? And so I think when someone in that sense says, oh, that's Kitty, I don't think if we settled them down and we like started making metaphysical distinctions, they would still persist in saying that's Kitty. They would more likely say that's what was Kitty. Right? So if your parents were hooked up to a machine and still technically living in a scientific sense, but then like their minds were like completely gone and all yeah. sort of sense of like their own personal identity was gone, you still would say like that is them. Is the machine breathing for them? Now we're getting into like ethics and stuff, but yes. Then they're, they're dead. But their body still, like the cells are living, they're still producing. But, it, but the, the, like the organism is not operating under its Got own it. substantial okay. integrity anymore. So you believe it's like the independent Independence yeah. of yeah, life. and I want to be very careful. I am not a bioethicist. Okay, so okay, I'm not yeah, saying yeah. when you can or cannot. Very clear on that. <laughs> okay, right. But yeah, I would say if the machine is breathing for them and they will never recover the power to maintain themselves mm -hmm. again, then I would say they are in fact dead. So if the machine wasn't breathing for them, sorry, I'm yeah. trying to let it. <laughs> yeah. But they like take the Alzheimer's example very extreme. They've yeah. completely lost their own sense of self. They don't have the first-person perspective. Yeah. Other people around them don't recognize them as themselves because they aren't acting or like in the conventional way that they had like yeah. behaviorally in the past. You still believe that that is them just because it's their body that is still... Yeah, but not because it's their bodies, because they are their bodies. So, okay. Right. I don't believe in garden fairies. I don't think there's this, your body and then another thing. There's just your body. What is your body, though? It's something constituted by matter and, and a soul. But... In my view, is you are your body. Yeah. So, Jack. Um, when you talk about souls and forms, yeah. uh, you wanted to be clear that they're not just this like extra entity. It's not like to get yeah. a yeah. to get a table. You know, you have all those things, and then oh, you gotta go find another leg, and then finally, once yeah. you get the leg under, now you got a table. Yeah. Um, and you know, but we you don't aggregate the, organisms. Right? Yep. Give the example of non-human living things totally makes sense. It's just yeah. all the parts and a certain arrangement and so forth. There's not something over and above that. Yeah. But then when you get to the case of humans, things get a little more difficult. Um, and I think there's two facts that people in your tradition tend to hold that I think it make it harder to hold onto this view and say that the soul yeah. is the substance. So the first one you've already brought up about how the you. soul can persist after the death of the yeah. organism. That's one thing that you think, well, isn't this something over and above if it keeps on going even when all the parts and the yep. arrangement is gone? But then the other fact that you didn't bring up, which I think other people in the tradition hold, is that it actually takes a miracle from God to even get that uh, form there in the first place. It's not as if just through uh, natural events you could even get that form there in the first place, which yep. is what you seem to be able to get uh, in the case of all other living things and then yep. non-living things. So... Those two facts together make it hard to think that this form of you know humans isn't something uh, over yeah. and above. It makes it seem like ah, it seems like it is kind. Of. So what would you say? To yeah. People no, who I, say that? I I think I think we have been trying to get the square peg in that round hole since Aristotle, right? And do you know what I mean? And I I don't claim that we get as nice and neat a picture here as we want. Do you see my point? 
Uh, and so, and, and I think, I think we, you know, in the tradition, we, we have been too quick to kind of gloss over those two, those exact problems. And, and we are, we are saying, in this case, the human soul is this exception, right? And, and it is something over and above the matter, okay? So on that one, uh, you know, I'll, because I, 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 I couple this, this is like maybe for over dinner, I couple this with a pretty hardcore scientific anti-realism, okay? So I am perfectly happy to say um, matter has no substantial integrity of its own whatsoever except is incorporated into some substantial system, okay? And so then I don't see souls and matter as interacting in any sense, because the matter has no integrity in its own right, okay? It's just prime matter, right? Or energy, what have you. Do you see my point? So in a sense then, right, uh, I'm happy to say souls in general are something over and above. There's just the question of survivability, right? But we've got to go way to the virtual presence thing in the scientific anti-realism on that. And I'm happy to do that, okay? There's a, there's a primer for you there, okay? On the, does it take a, uh, a miracle to bring about human soul? Yeah, and, and that, I'll say, that's, I'll put my foot down. Yeah, it does, why? Well, because there are effects in the organism that are not bodily effects, so there must be some non-bodily cause for this, okay? And uh, does that fit terribly neatly in the picture? I don't think it does, but I think, it's not just for day fide reasons, but I think it's imposed on us by the arguments from separability. All right. Now, I do think, though, uh, there's no reason not to think that um, embryology is perfectly predictive of when we get humans and things like that. But I will, yeah, I will agree, as uncomfortable as it makes us, that there is a miraculous act there. Yeah. Does that make sense? But the, 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 your worry goes back to, it, it's all over the medieval tradition, people worried about this, but you know, this sounds more like Plato than it does Aristotle, right? Yeah. So if I understand how you're, how you're describing the soul, um, what we can call the powers of the soul aren't really uh, powers of the soul, but really of the body, right? Yeah, well, I mean, after you care, I, I want to make a distinction between body and matter, <laughs> okay? I think you are a soul matter compound, right? You as a body are a soul matter compound, okay? So I think the powers of the soul, yeah, are the powers of a living body. Right? So, so like the neuroscience is basically explaining all these powers that we couldn't explain before yeah. in terms of yeah. the way we're made up. But you, know, but you know, one thing I want to note is it's not as if the Greeks didn't realize if somebody got bumped in the head that they, they lost a lot of their cognitive wherewithal. It's not as if the medievals didn't realize if somebody got a head injury. You know, so this idea that somehow with neuroscience we're discovering for the first time that there's an intimate link between our bodily lives and our psychological lives, I just don't think that's true. Even Descartes is aware of this and worrying about it, right? Uh, I think, though, what neuroscience is doing is it's discovering the specificity, right? But it's a specificity I think the Thomistic tradition would have expected in the first place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Father? How or the corruptionist father? view... Um, One more time, sir. Uh, how does the corruptionist view approach questions about particular judgment, about yep. the existence of the saints? See, and how yeah, and that's... Okay, that's what's driving the survivalist view, is they think it's theologically easier, okay? Um, I don't know why I, my life couldn't be judged upon my death, right? And, and say, look, you know, Madden, you know, we have Madden's soul here, we're gonna judge the life that that soul led was worthy of, of salvation or damnation, or maybe needs to be purged. We, we could maybe have to purge the soul, right, uh, in the interim, Right. So, so I think that all the theological stuff that we need there, I think we can gloss it to work with the corruptionist position. Father? Including the fiat provision that the souls are just in the interim? Yeah. I mean, I think the soul could be there. And, yeah, yeah, right. Because the yeah. view, we're distinguishing between 
whether you survive or whether your soul survives. Right. And and I and and okay. And once we once we open a theological speculation, right? It's like now now we've got both hands up, right? <laughs> okay. None of this. Um, I mean, gee, maybe maybe Saint Peter's been resurrected. You know, maybe he's there bodily having the beatific vision. Mary is the ultimate survivalist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess you could go either way on that too, though, right? Was, was it just the corpse or was she alive? Isn't there a debate about that? My view would be she would be alive, but always would. But, but so I, I, think, I think there's ways you could gloss these things theologically to make it come out. Right? But I'm happy, I'm happy to take the to correction on that. Yeah, Olivia. Yes. Oh, this is young, this young man here. Oh, sorry. Your name? Oh, sorry. Uh, Chris. Chris. This might be a stupid question, but oh, please. Um, Trust me, I've heard worse. <laughs> so, as far as the claim that there's something miraculous about the creation of yeah. human life and human yeah. soul, does holding that as miraculous imply that it can't be done by humans? And should we um, come upon the technological power yeah. to create the matter that constitutes humans? Like, I mean, not even yeah, but, but humans thing. already do it, don't they? I mean, I mean I've done it six times. In the right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, Mary, woman, do you have any children? Yes. Yeah. There you go. You, tell you what. Yeah, yeah. You, you've done it, right? I mean, we through natural processes we contribute to the creation of human life, and we admit, maybe awkwardly, that God's jumping in there and doing something, and why can't we say if we did this in a laboratory under far less interesting circumstances, right, that God could jump in there yeah. too, you know, I mean, we're, we, either way, I think you're right, Chad, we have to tell, as Catholics, we have to admit, we're telling an awkward story there, right, uh, there it is, yeah, but I, I would say, let's say we do clone, and probably have, right, uh, a human child, I would say, yep, God jumped in there, <clears throat> and infused a soul. At some point, the, the Catholic thing is going to cost me, right? <laughs> that, that's where I'd like to pull. Sir, have you heard any arguments or do people advocate that if you could fully explain the soul, then it truly doesn't exist? I guess what, what I want to know what would it mean to fully explain it. I guess that would mean, by definition, possibly a general consensus of people agreeing that and it is fully explained, and I'm pulling that out of my yeah. left ear. So. I, I, think, I think that would be a worry if what we're talking about is the soul as the seat of consciousness. Okay. And I think we probably will have something like an explanation in your sense in that, in that way. Okay. In the tradition I'm coming from, when we say soul, we don't mean seat of consciousness. We mean the, that which provides the substantial integrity of an organism. And for that, I don't even know what a scientific explanation of that would even look like. I don't think it's a scientific question. It's a metaphysical question, right? And so I, if what you mean by soul is that which does my feeling, right, or is my, my, that which has my consciousness, I think we're well on our way to a perfectly good scientific explanation of that, right? Uh, if what you mean by soul is that which provides something, a living thing with both synchronic and diachronic explanation, uh, uh, integrity, I don't know what a scientific explanation of that would even look like, and in fact, I think it really just is a different kind of question that the sciences can't can't answer. I don't mean that it's not. No, and I didn't take it that way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Well, yeah. So going back to the corruption with you, because I think it's very the, much hung up on the that. young people <laughs> love this debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but in that case, like, what do corruptionists care with the whole idea of like? Christians are called to kind of reject their bodily desires for like their spiritual goodness and like what do corruptionists care if we live a good life or not because like you are not the one surviving and like being purified or going to hell or something like that. Yeah. Um, I guess as a uh, corruption is going to say there, it's because ultimately if you live a a more you know a a a, a more Ascetic might overstate it, right? But a, a, a more ascetic life, it's ultimately going to be better for your body come resurrection time, right? <laughs> right? You're, you're gonna, it's going to purify the soul, and and the soul is the integrity of the body, right? Mm -hmm. And and so ultimately, your you know your bodily life after resurrection will be all the better, right? Yeah. 
Sorry, I'm sorry. Christian. Christian. Could we just say that this is where philosophy has hit that limit and we'll never really... Yeah, okay, so, this, so you know, I have my corruptionist leanings, but you know, the more I follow this debate, the more I'm coming to... I'm getting much more apophatic about the soul. Meaning I think I can show you that there is such a thing. I think I can show you it's separable. But the more we speculate about what's going on with separated souls, interim states, stuff like that, the more I think we're getting beyond what we can do, except by revelation, okay? And, right. and, and so in this one, increasingly, I'm, I'm starting to punt this to the theologians, right? Hi. So based on the definition of soul you gave a few minutes ago, so I think the gentleman over there, yeah. I'm a whole collection of souls then, right? Insofar as a physical body is a collection of living organisms. Yeah, okay, so this is, uh, this is actually Don Scotus's view, right? This is a, a medieval Franciscan, not a Dominican. Uh, yeah, no. uh, he has this view. He, 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 it's called, uh, I think it's plural formism, right? It, and where that it, he thinks of, of the organism as actually a stack of systems, each with his own soul, okay? So this is going to come down to you know, uh, very sophisticated debates about whether or not a stack of systems has a single integrity or not. Okay? Uh, I'm of the view, I take the Thomistic position, that I think, no, actually, if you were indeed a stack of systems, you wouldn't be one thing. You clearly are one thing. So there must be some overarching soul that this thing is all, that, that's governing the whole thing. How am I clearly one thing? Like, explain that. What, what makes me clearly one thing and not a collection of things? Uh, well, first of all, all of your parts exist as parts of that kind, only as much as they're part of that system. Dependent upon one another. Like your circulatory system doesn't exist. Except it's a circulatory heart, system of that system. organism, yeah. right? So if we, if we took your heart out, mm -hmm. oh, well, that's back, sure. but if we, if we you know, took your liver out, right? Sure. immediately the liver is degraded. It's, it's dying. It has no integrity as liver mm -hmm outside of its existence in you. But if I cut my finger off, yeah. I'm not me anymore? I'm something else no, entirely? The, the very fact that you can survive the loss of parts is part of the case for soul here. Because you're clearly not identical. You aren't identical to your parts. Mm -hmm. Though your parts oh. only exist as parts of you. All of the cells you're born with are all gone. That, like, your, the, each individual cell is right. constantly like, dying and growing. So, right. like, all the screws are changing. Right. Right. If I can remove part of me and still remain me, then that must suggest that I have parts. Right. Doesn't that make sense? I to can't remove be, part of you, you have to I can't parts. Be one, I can't be one thing and remove part of the thing. You can't be one uniform whole and also remove part of one uniform whole. Mm -hmm. You must be composite in some way. Some, in some sense, yeah. Okay. Well, then couldn't we use that uh, observation to say that then I'm also a system of souls? If I can be a system no, of physical you're, things you're that are living. Yeah, because well, I don't think you are a system of physical things that are living, right? Your, your, your a living system of things, remember, mm -hmm. as soon as we remove your parts, right, they have no powers of survival, or I shouldn't say, they... they 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 maintain their own only their identity of they maintain their identity only as parts of you. If we remove them from you, they're immediately degrading, right? What if we can if we can preserve them though? Say you take my hand and attach it to Alvaro, and you take Alvaro. Yeah, but it's got to be attached. It's got to be attached to someone else. Though. What about a hand transplant? Then it's but it's but, different. Then it's Alvaro's hand. Yeah, it's not my hand yeah. anymore. Yeah, and immediately what's going to happen? It's going to start to be slowly replaced. Right. Sure. By other other material stuff, right? But if it if it has parts that can be replaced, maybe we just at an impasse here. It yeah. just seems to me if it has parts that can be replaced and it's composite, yeah, stop there. It's not uniform. No, I'm not. I'm saying, in this sense, it doesn't have parts in the sense that you're saying parts, because okay. you're you're taking parts of humans to be like parts of a car, right? If you just sure. if you pull the carburetor on the car and you set it down. There is no change in the carburetor by that process, right? You just simply detach it, okay? Sure. You pull your liver out, it's a very different consequence for your liver. Your liver has been destroyed, right, <laughs> by being pulled out there. In one sense, but the basic matter that composes the liver sure, is but, changing. Yeah, but th that's the same basic matter that composes everything else. Sure. Right? Yeah. Hi, I'm Karen. Okay. Um, following 
So I had the view of souls as a very very thing that makes sure. people special. You're not alone. <laughs> so what makes humans different from say a monkey? Not not a non living thing, but and not a plant exactly, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have this, this power of, of, of abstract thought and deductive reasoning. And I think that is novel. I think that does make us think that our soul is somehow special in uncomfortable ways, right? Uh, yeah, so I, I, the, the claim is not that humans aren't unique. The claim, though, is when we say humans have a soul, we're making the same kind of claim that we make about other living things, and then, frankly, inanimate things, too. All right, that's thank you.